So I'll, I'll give everyone a couple of minutes. People are already participating, so that's great. Um, and be as honest as you want to be because this is anonymous and no one's going to see this except for us at the end. While that's running, we, we decided to let Jess off the hook from singing the Jeopardy tune, but I'll just say uh, <laughs> I'm Wayne and uh, I'm happy to uh, welcome everyone and co-moderate with my colleague Sarita Patil here. As Sarita, I was thinking, and we'll do more formal introductions in a second, but I was um, just thinking about the literature on these questions. And I think it's about um, annual incidence around something like 12 or 15% of people experiencing an allergic reaction. So what, like roughly one out of eight or so on an annual basis. So I'm really curious to see how that will match with this audience. Although it's a little hard to extrapolate. I mean, that doesn't mean exactly once every eight years for a given individual, but I'm often surprised, I don't know about you, I'll see a patient who hasn't had a reaction maybe in 10 years, that's not so uncommon. Where, and then other people that react, you know, almost annually. Yeah. And I've also seen sort of different um, patterns in different parts of people's lives. So I think that plays a big role. Yeah. All right, I'll give another minute or two. We have about 60% participation right now. We just have a few more to get on the screen. We should have a follow-up question maybe about like for people that are uncomfortable, you know, what are the areas around which, um, I, I just had a patient uh, yesterday actually for whom, you know, just the act of administering the epinephrine auto injector was really kind of the stumbling block. They had a lot of anxiety around just using the device. So we arranged, you know, to have some intervention specifically around that. I have to say, Wayne, you know, you're going to, guys are going to find out I have food allergies myself. And, you know, I've had two children now, one with a very late epidural. I have a pretty high pain threshold. And yet every single time I've had to take out that EpiPen, I feel like a little kid again and be like, it's going to hurt. And I'm, you know, way too old to be feeling that way. And yet I still feel it every single time. Um, so I think there is some aspect that's incredibly normal about it that, you know, doesn't really go away, even when you know it doesn't really hurt. Yeah, but you've already, you know, you've had the experience of using an epinephrine auto injector on yourself. So, you know, you, you do sort of have that memory. Yes, as an adult. <laughs> All righty. Well, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and then we'll be able to quickly see the results. Or should be able to. Let me know. Can you all see the results? Okay. All right. So it looks like we have a range of things, and I'll let um, Wayne Tiffler and three to um, comment on it. Yeah. So we'll yeah. start with this first question, I think. Um, so, number one was when was the last time that you had an allergic reaction? Kind of getting that what Wayne was referring to. Uh, due to an accidental exposure and 56%, so five out of the uh, um, folks who responded said less than a year ago, 11% um, said one to three years ago, another 22% said three to five years ago, and 11% said more than five years ago. So I would say the majority of, of folks that are joining us today did have an you know, accidental exposure um, and an allergic reaction less than a year ago. Yeah. Fascinating. So I'll read out the next one. So how comfortable, uh, this is interesting, I think, because uh, again, about a little over half the respondents felt mostly comfortable and a fifth, you know, very comfortable. Um, and really nice to see that no one, um, you know, indicated that they weren't comfortable at all. So I think that's great. To follow up on that, you know, that, that idea about, you know, one's comfort zone, it was also really great to see that in this next question, you know, um, almost everyone feels, you know, either very or mostly comfortable, like recognizing and treating an allergic reaction, which is really great. Yeah, we spend a lot of time in clinic talking about that, and it's often a source of some anxiety, I, I think often among parents, I think by the time um, you know, my patients are, you know, this age, I think they often, they usually have a good handle on it consistent with this. So how prepared do you feel to manage your food allergy once you're at college? And again, nice to see, you know, three quarters, at least somewhat prepared, or sorry, everyone, at least somewhat prepared and half mostly prepared or better. So it does great. look like this will be a really helpful, um, panel discussion. So we're really excited that everyone is joining us today. 
All right, so I kick off the more formal uh, welcome. So again, um, we wanna welcome everyone and we're gonna uh, sort of introduce the group. Um, I'm Wayne Shruffler, I'm a pediatric allergist. I'm uh, the division chief uh, at Mass General of Pediatric Allergy and Immunology. I, I see patients um, every week, um, you know, really in the pediatric age range, but certainly follow a lot of patients through uh, their college years before often transitioning them to my colleagues like Dr. Patil. That will be my cue. So my name is Sarita Patil. I'm an adult allergist and immunologist and assistant professor at Mass General. I'm a translational researcher, so my lab mostly focuses on the role of antibodies in allergic diseases, but I also help write clinical trials in, in food allergy. And I also have a subspecialty clinic that I started about a decade ago now that, that really focuses on a multidisciplinary approach to eosinophil gastrointestinal diseases. And, um, you know, in my everyday practice, I see a lot of folks who come to Boston, you know, for um, higher education, and they oftentimes come to see me as they're doing, making this transition. And so um, I'm really glad to see that everyone is joining us here today. And we have a really fantastic lineup uh, today of panelists that are, you know, ready to discuss this topic with you. And so I'm just going to plunge in and start introducing our panelists. Um, so our first panelist is uh, Yamini Verkud. Dr. Verkud is a pediatric allergist and immunologist and assistant professor at UNC Chapel Hill. She's also a faculty here at Mass General Hospital in Boston and an associate epidemiologist at the Channing um, Division of Network Medicine. Uh, currently, her lab conducts research on profiling different food allergic reactions to oral immunotherapy. Next, we have Lisa Steed. Lisa is a pediatric food allergy nurse at MGH. Uh, she was previously a part-time school nurse uh, for students in pre-K to eighth grade. She's also the mother of three sons who are now all adults. Uh, I have the pleasure of knowing some of them. They're amazing individuals, and two of them uh, have grown up with food allergies. Next, we have uh, Dr. Theodora Kakis. So Maria Theodora Kakis is a pediatric psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. She specializes in supporting youth and families that are managing chronic medical conditions, including food allergies. She helps run the Food Allergy Buddies Program and New Transitions Program at Mass General Hospital. And I have the pleasure of calling her my colleague. And next we have Krista Martin. Krista joined, I think that's the Harvard University Dining Services in 1998 and spearheads HUD strategic initiatives, uh, guiding the planning and implementation of work in the areas of sustainability, food donation, business development and planning, customer service and more. She serves on the Menu of Change University Research Collaborative and was named a food hero by the city of Cambridge in 2015 for her work on HUD's food donation program. Next, we have Karen Jew, who is a registered dietitian for the Harvard University Dining Services. She joined HUDS in 2021 and has been supporting college and university students with food allergies since 2013. Karen sees her role as connecting students with the foods they need to stay well nourished. Thank you for joining us. And our final panelist, although we do have a couple of other people to introduce as well, Sam Levitt. Sam is a currently a freshman at UMass Amherst studying mechanical engineering. He's had food allergies for the majority of his life and he's going to share his experience of managing food allergies while in college. Thanks for being with us, Sam. We've also been really fortunate to have a fabulous support to put this panel together. And so we want to introduce uh, two additional colleagues who have been really instrumental in putting our event tonight together. Um, and the first is Dr. Nancy Rotter, who's a pediatric psycho uh, psychologist and director of the psychological services in the Food Allergy Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. And Jess McDougall. Uh, Dr. McDougall is currently a first year fellow in allergy immunology at UNC with an interest in food allergy and patient education. Thanks for being here, Jess. So to kick off our event today, we're gonna to have Dr. Yamini Verkud, who's already introduced a little bit of what she'll be talking about today. Yamini, take it away. All right, I'm hoping everybody can see the right screen right now. Okay, so as I sort of, already mentioned, we're going to talk about adulting with food allergies, particularly with regards to what that looks like at college. Um, and as I hinted already, I have food allergies myself. Um, and so I've essentially, um, hold on. 
Um, I've essentially been adulting with food allergy for over two decades. Uh, so I know a lot about this. I did it at a time where there was maybe less support. Um, and so hopefully you guys can learn from my mistakes. Um, and we're all human, we all make mistakes. Um, and I promise you, there will be mistakes made with regards to your food allergies. And so I'm gonna start out with a little story, maybe a confession, if you will, of my own mistake. Um, and so that is me. Um, I was probably in my mid thirties, starting a brand new job at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and to welcome me into that position, I had my two new bosses, uh, Wayne Schreffler as a <coughs> team on the panel, um, and Dr. Paul Hesterberg, our clinical director, who were taking me out and our families to dinner. And it was a beautiful new Italian restaurant. And I know my allergies. I'm allergic to chickpeas, peas, peanuts, lentils, and Italian restaurants are pretty low risk for me. I don't really have to worry too much about them. So of course, everybody's really excited about this restaurant. They decide to order this amazing honey ricotta dish that, you know, you dip the bread in. It's supposed to be fantastic. We order that off right away. And they bring over a dip and, you know, it's dimly lit. We're distracted by each other's conversation. And I take the bread and I dunk it into this dip and I take a big bite. And this tastes nothing like honey ricotta, but it tastes delicious. And so I decided to take another sort of big bite. And my husband next to me is stopping me because what I have is not honey ricotta, but this, obviously some hummus. And I, he's trying to tell me, okay, I don't think you should eat anymore. I'm pretty sure this is hummus. This is not the honey ricotta. And I say, no, 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 no. I know my body. If this were chickpeas, I'd be itching by now. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm getting ready to put another bite in my mouth. And he's like, no, please just wait a second. And of course, a few minutes go by and then the itching sets in and my mouth is almost like on fire with how much it's itching. And so then I tell him, okay, you were right. This is definitely some chickpeas. I'm going to go to the bathroom and take care of myself. Don't tell anybody that I'm having an allergic reaction. And I run off. And I think about this story in retrospect, because it's just like everything you could do wrong. Um, so let's, let's go over everything I did wrong, right? Um, so I ate food and because we were so excited about this dish, we hadn't talked to the, I hadn't ordered my food yet. So I hadn't talked to the waiter about my food allergies yet. Um, I assumed the restaurant was low risk because generally I don't have too many problems with Italian restaurants. I tried to hide my reaction from others who at the table were probably the most qualified people to treat my reaction besides myself. And I left alone to go to the bathroom to treat myself. There were only two things I did right, I think. And one is at least I told my husband that I was reacting. Um, and of course I told him, don't tell anybody. I walk away and I can hear him announcing to the whole table, she's having an allergic reaction. I was like, what are you doing? You're doing the exact opposite of what I wanted. <laughs> but he was doing the right thing. Um, and the only other good thing I did was I had my epinephrine with me. And thankfully I didn't have to use my epinephrine that time, but at least I had it with me. Um, so what's going on here? Like I am in my, at the time I was in my mid thirties. I've had food allergies for a long time. I am an allergist who trains people on how to manage their allergies. Why, where did I go wrong here? And I think that what goes on here is what goes on for any person as they enter the adult world, start meeting new people, and we encounter factors that alter our judgment. And so one of the biggest factors here was I was trying to impress my new bosses who hired me to do food allergy research and take care of kids with food allergy. And here I was showing, I couldn't even manage my own food allergies. And that was much scarier than the idea that I might be in the bathroom giving myself a benefit to me. And that is the warped decision-making that happens to some of us when we're in these high stress positions. We're worried that everybody's looking at us, that everybody is judging us. Um, we might be out you know, at a study group with new people or a meeting with a TA or a professor, and then somebody might say, hey, let's get some food. And they're not thinking, you might not be thinking about the food and your food allergies. You're thinking about impressing that TA, TF or TA or impressing that um, professor at the time or impressing your new friends. 
you may be on a date and you're so excited about the person you're with and you kind of forget that, yeah, when you order your, your food, you also need to mention what you're allergic to. And then there's a part that none of the parents want to think about, but it's a reality of college and adulthood. And that is factors that may alter our judgment, whether it's alcohol, drugs, and not that we condone any of this, but the reality is that these are factors that alter our judgment and make us less able to make the decisions we would normally make. But it doesn't even have to be these factors. It can literally be staying up all night, working on you know, a you know, paper or studying for an exam and you are exhausted and you are not make, thinking the way you normally think. Um, so everything I'm talking about is every parent's worst nightmare, right? We are worried and the real fear is that the parents are worried about is that you are going to make mistakes that are very human mistakes, but those mistakes are suddenly gonna be about your food allergies and then badness is gonna happen. And in the world of food allergies, what badness means in terms of what parents are scared about is death. It may be that you guys are scared about this too. And so let's spend a little time talking about that. What is the actual risk that we are we food allergic people are going to make a mistake and then we're gonna die because of that mistake? So they have this really nice study. And what it does is at the bottom, it looks at the likelihood that somebody's going to die from various causes. And this is a dark conversation, but I think it's a useful conversation to have. And so we can see here that, and this isn't just the general population. This is like the risk for a food allergic individual. So, you know, all the patients out there and me, right? Our personal risk is maybe one in 10 of going to the emergency room for an injury. Um, one in a hundred for death from any cause in a given year. Um, one in 10,000 from death due to an accident. And that's usually car accidents, motor vehicle accidents. Um, now it gets really dark. Death due to murder, one in 10,000. Death due to fire, one in a hundred thousand. And then here are, are food allergic individuals. So we are literally taking more risk every single time we get into a car and buckle our seatbelt than we do navigating the world with our food allergies. And that to me is reassuring because I do not panic about, you know, getting in a car, assuming the driver's relatively safe, as, as much as people panic about their food allergies. And I think that helps kind of adjust our expectations about this big fear that we're all so scared about. And yet, we need to be safe about this, but it's not as common as we all think it is. So, you know, not to minimize the outcome, right? Death is a pretty scary outcome. And so how do you minimize that risk even further? And the way you do that is you have a plan. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna outline some things that you wanna cover on your plan, okay? The later speakers are gonna fill in the details of how you address each part of the plan. But my goal is to give you the list of things that you need to talk about when you go off with your family about what you need to figure out. And so that includes things like, how are you gonna notify the college about your food allergies? How are you gonna deal with it when it comes to navigating the dining halls? When you go to restaurants, especially restaurants that you've never been to before, cuisines that you've never tried before, how are you gonna deal with that? How are you gonna deal with dating, especially intimacy and dating, especially if your date just had something you're allergic to? How are you gonna deal with parties? And there are a lot of aspects to parties that we need to think about in terms of that altered judgment, in terms of the number of people, in terms of where you're taking your epinephrine with you at these parties. Um, think about, you know, if your altered mental status for whatever reason, whether it's something that we don't condone or something that is, you know, just natural parts of college, staying up late and working and you're exhausted, how are you going to deal with that? How are you going to communicate what's going on in your lives with your parents and what are expectations? Because I guarantee you, your parents' expectations about communication and yours are probably totally different. And then how do you feel about treating your allergic reactions? You know, like you're exhausted. Do you know how to treat your allergic reactions even when you're totally sleep deprived? Do you know how to find medical help when you're on campus? Um, when you're not, you know, when you can't find your cell phone because somewhere lost in your room and you're downstairs and you forgot to bring your cell phone with you, how do you get help? And then knowing your allergist, allergy list. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that in detail. And we're gonna talk about how important it is and what your plan is for carrying your epinephrine and your medications. And this part is so important because 
As far as your parents concerned, they're taking their little precious baby and they're sending them to walk off the scary tightrope of college and who knows what's gonna happen to them. And the thing that everybody needs to remember here is A, the tightrope is not as scary as we all think it is, right? Compared to based on the data we saw before. But B, your safety net here is your epinephrine. Early treatment of epinephrine leads to better outcomes in allergic reactions. So we need to have a plan of how that epinephrine goes with you everywhere. So let's first talk about your allergy list. Most of you have probably been practicing listing your allergies for a long time now. If you haven't, now is definitely the time to start doing that. You need to be the one who's comfortable talking to waiters, comfortable judging if you think the waiter or waitress is really listening to what you're saying about your allergies, or maybe, you know, they don't seem to get it. Maybe you need to double check in some ways. Maybe you need to talk to the chef or something like that. Um, so you need to be really comfortable communicating your allergies. But most of us know how to deal with our allergies in our little bubble, right? If we always eat at Chinese restaurants and Italian restaurants, you may go to a Japanese restaurant and not really be as familiar with the menu and the thing, the foods that are higher risk for you. And so knowing how different cuisines deal with your allergen um, and being able to navigate that process because you're gonna try new things and that is an amazing thing about college. You're gonna go to new restaurants, you're gonna have friends who cook meals for you, but all of those people might not be as good at ma managing your allergies as your parents are or your guardians are. And so the more you can manage your allergies and know what's on a menu yourself, the safer you're gonna be. But then there's another aspect to knowing your allergy list. And that is this. Most of us with, were diagnosed with our allergies when we were tiny little chicks. And they gave us these allergies and we followed the list. And some of you followed very closely with your allergists, but some of you may have lost touch because you know your allergies, right? They haven't changed, except that might not always be the case. If you're someone who was diagnosed 18 years ago, the way we diagnosed allergies was different at that time. The way we recommended that people avoid groups of foods were different at that time. You know, at that time, we probably told someone, okay, you're allergic to a peanut, avoid all nuts. And that's not necessarily something we recommend anymore. And the reason is because, you know, if you're avoiding all nuts, you're avoiding, you know, somewhere between eight and 10 different foods. And as the world changes, people use those foods in different ways. So I have a lot of patients who tell me, you know what, it's just easier for me to avoid all nuts. That's just one category and it makes things simple. But what I will tell you from my personal experience is that the world, especially the culinary world changes on me. So the things that were hard to avoid when I was a kid, like peanuts, are actually incredibly easy to avoid now because there's better awareness of peanut allergy. But the things that were really easy to avoid when I was a kid, like chickpeas, are really hard to avoid now because of gluten-free foods that use chickpeas as a substitute, because of the popularity of hummus, all things that did not exist when I was a kid. So you may be avoiding a whole group of foods and think that is easy now, but that might not be easy in 20 years. And your picky teenager, because I was that picky teenager, who doesn't seem to be interested in any foods, may be much more interested in these foods when their date wants to take them out to this restaurant. They may be much more interested in exploring new cuisines when their roommate wants to cook these foods. And so the idea that you would, that you would imagine that your kid is going to stay a picky person for the rest of their lives is unfortunately a little short-sighted. And so the more we can push that boundary and really know exactly what you're allergic to and exactly what you're not, the more prepared we are as adults with food allergy to sort of navigate the world. And so if you haven't seen your allergist in a long time, this might be a good time to touch base with them again and just confirm that you're allergic to everything you think you're allergic to. So the next thing is people go out into the world and they tell me, yes, I carry my epinephrine everywhere I go. But everywhere I go usually means there's some at home and some at school. And we all kind of forget, you know, like, oh yeah, there are other places we go besides home and school. And some of you are excellent at this and some of you might not be as great at this. Um, so things I'd like you to think about, right, is, you know, you're now going to have a different place that you go to eat, right? You're gonna have a dining hall. That dining hall might be in the same place that you live. So normally you're at home and you go to your kitchen and you never think about taking your epinephrine because your epinephrine is wherever you keep your epinephrine in your house. But now 
you're going to go downstairs, many flights, maybe walk down some hallways, and you're going to go to a dining room, maybe in your pajamas, and you might not be carrying epinephrine with you. But you that is a high risk place that you might have an allergic reaction potentially. And so think through, well, if I'm in my PJs, how am I going to take my, my epi with me? The other place people forget about is I'm going for a run. I don't need my epinephrine. I'm just running. I'm not eating. But of course, you go for a run with your friends. Then you guys decide to stop by for coffee. Then you run into some more friends. You want to grab some ice cream. And now you're in a place where the risk for, of having a food allergic reaction has increased pretty dramatically. So my personal rule for myself that makes my life easier is if there is any chance that food will cross my lips, then I'm taking my epinephrine with me. And I like to eat food. So it means that essentially short of going to pick up mail from the mailbox, my epinephrine goes with me wherever I go. And that allows me to maybe eat at a riskier place, take chances in certain things and not be nervous that I'm gonna get myself into trouble. The other thing I'd like to think about, right, is, okay, so how do you take your epinephrine with you? You're going to go to formals or parties. When you're dressed up like this, where is the epinephrine in these outfits? And so you got to have to have a plan for how you're going to fit your epi in this kind of jacket. Um, and finally, you know, you're going to visit your roommate. You're go just going to study. It's late. You're not planning on getting anything. And then you make a last minute decision that, you know, oh yeah, we have some snacks. Let's go eat some snacks. So all of these things happen and life changes. And if you can just make sure you have your epinephrine through all those changes, that lets you engage in those changes without having to worry. The next thing to think about is how do you carry your epinephrine, right? If you are someone who carries a purse, it makes it easier, but your purse has to be big enough to carry two EpiPens. And I will tell you, sometimes that is harder than you think. Um, if you are trying to be, you know, go, trying to work out, a runner's belt can sometimes be helpful, something with a thin profile. And sometimes people use these thinner profile belts um, under their shirt. So if you're wearing a slightly baggier shirt, that can fit underneath and that's a way to carry your epinephrine where it's not as big and bulky. Um, and lastly, some people like drawstring bags as a way to sort of carry that out where they go. So these are all things to sort of, you know, stimulate some conversation with you. So what are you going to do for the next hours, days, years, et cetera, with all this information? The first thing you're going to do is take a deep breath because we talked about some scary things, right? Some places where, where risk can happen, right? Um, you're going to listen to our amazing speakers because they're going to go into much more detail about a lot of these topics. And then you're going to ask lots of questions and there are no dumb questions, okay? We will not judge you for any question you want to ask. And then you're going to sit down with your family and you're going to make your plan. You're going to fill in the gaps using the stuff you've learned today to figure out how you're going to deal with all these things like parties and dining halls, et cetera. And then in a few months, you're going to go off to college. And guess what's going to happen? You are going to make mistakes. And so then you're going to readdress your plan. And then you're going to make more mistakes. And then you're going to readdress your plan. And I will tell you, I have gone through this process a bunch of times. And you're going to repeat this process in every aspect of your life, not just food allergies. But the key that is going to help you here is relying on your support network and being open about the mistakes you made. You know, we, I don't expect my patients to go off and never have an accidental ingestion ever. I expect my patients to take more epinephrine with them and know how to manage it when these mistakes, when these things happen. Um, so I hope you enjoy the rest of our, our talks and I'm happy to answer any questions as things go along. Yeah, I think mean, that was a great presentation. You know, I, I have the privilege of calling you and um, your husband, Brian, good friends of mine. But, you know, something we've never actually talked about very much was, you know, how did you uh, initially discuss your food allergies when you were just, you know, starting to date Brian? How did that, how did that go? I was very bad about talking about my food allergies, but it was a different era, you know? So I would tell you most of my college and most of my high school friends knew nothing about my allergies. It was just something I managed on my own. In college, I think some of them might have started to know, but not really. And in med school, my um, I started whatever it was, whether it was changes in my own body. And that's one thing I would warn you, the way my allergies have manifested over the years have changed over the years. But in medical school, it became harder and harder to manage my allergies. And I had more and more allergic reactions. And I had more and more stories like the one I shared with you of trying to manage my allergic reactions by myself. Um, and so thankfully with my husband, we were friends before we started dating. So he had heard me at least mentioning some of my food allergies when we would hang out as friends. 
but it was a very variable thing. And it had to be a very concrete discussion when we started dating, because it is one thing when your friends are eating things you're allergic to sitting next to you. It's a very another th very different thing when the person you're hoping to kiss is eating the things that you're allergic to. And in the beginning, like, you know, Lisa's going to give you a lot more information about when is a safe period, but we essentially like I, there was no safe period in the beginning. <laughs> um, and over the years, we've sort of settled into a place where he can eat things that I'm allergic to. We've got a routine, but that was a hard conversation to have because here you are setting boundaries for someone when you're trying to impress them and show, yeah, yeah I have no boundaries. Like I'm really chill. <laughs> um, so it, there's definitely a disconnect there. Um, and I think that I would tell you, the mom and me maybe would tell you that if someone can't handle this, you would, you, they're maybe not the right partner for you anyway, you know? So it's maybe a way to test the person you're dating. Thank you so much for sharing that, Yami. That was fabulous. Um, yeah, so, excellent. So I think, Jess, you're going to launch us on the next poll? Yes, I sure am. Great. Um, so this one launches nicely because we're talking about EpiPens and then emergency care. So I'll just quickly read them and give you guys a minute or so to answer the questions. But how comfortable you feel using your epinephrine auto injector from very comfortable, it's not comfortable at all. How often do you carry your epinephrine auto injector with you um, from always to never? And then how comfortable do you feel seeking emergency care or even calling your doctor for allergic reactions while you're off, while you're off in college? Um, so very comfortable to not comfortable at all. And we're getting some good participation already. So I'll just wait one more minute and then we'll see the results. All right, just need about, I think four or five more people to put in their answers and they'll be good. Yeah, Amini, your boss must've been a real jerk to make you feel so intimidated at that restaurant. I did feel bad for you. <laughs> I think I've known you for maybe a month tops. You know? <laughs> like <laughs> in retrospect, it seems so ridiculous and childish, but it was my first like real job, right? Yeah. I mean. <laughs> All righty, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll for the sake of time so we can keep on moving. And I'll show the results really quickly. All right, you guys able to see those? So it looks like overall for how comfortable they're, so we have some work to do because there are some people that are only feeling mostly comfortable or not comfortable at all. So I'm glad to see some people feel very comfortable um, using their epinephrine. And then how often do we carry it? I'm glad to see that it's either most of the time or always. So that's great. Having that plan in place and making sure you're gonna do okay. And then last question, how comfortable do you um, feel seeking emergency care? I'm glad to see that at least Everyone that answered is feeling somewhat comfortable, mostly comfortable or very comfortable with that. Excellent, thanks, Jess. So I think uh, we have Lisa next. Um, and I think Marie is gonna run the slides. So bear with us, we get a little bit out of sync. But. Sorry, Lisa, I think I may have not started at the very beginning here. There we go. Lisa, can you unmute? I think we're having some technical difficulties here. with us for just a second. Lisa, can you hear us? You're still muted. Oh, okay, okay. I can hear you, yeah. There we go, perfect. Okay, great, so you, you can advance. So 
asking the question if a food allergy is a disability, and it is considered a disability under federal civil rights law, you, you can advance um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And in 2012, Lesley University was uh, sued by a group of students who were mandated to use the meal plan but weren't receiving accommodations for um, diseases like food allergies and celiac. And this was just an amazing case uh, in that it changed the landscape incredibly. Uh, I had one, <clears throat> excuse me, one child who went to college before this and one after, and the difference was amazing. It was a game changer. And colleges are just continuing to do better with the management of food allergies in their setting. Uh, and then there was a similar case in 2018 that reinforced the decision um, in 2012. So, you know, it's pretty well established um, that uh, it is considered a disability in this setting. Advance. Um, it is the responsibility of the student to notify the school. These protections are out there, but the school doesn't go seeking students with food allergies. You have to notify the school and advance. Um, and this is to ensure reasonable accommodations. And, and that is um, something that has to be decided in the, the situation. Next slide. So sharing health information, there's different uh, federal laws, this HIPAA and FERPA, and I won't go into these, they're very complicated. Um, but because of these laws, when you submit your health information to health services, they can't just share this information with dining services and residential life and campus safety. So once you commit to a school, the best way to do this is to contact the Office of Disability Services or Accommodation Services, um, where they can act as a, a coordinator. Advance. Uh, and then with the student's consent, the information can be shared and coordinated with other departments. Um, this, these laws are uh, very protective of health information and student information, but um, the students can sign a FERPA waiver or a HIPAA release that will allow the parent to be notified of like health uh, related information or things like grades or violations. Next. Um, and then from our perspective, the, we're willing to do documentation for students to help them with their accommodations at school. So if you've already committed to a school, let us know so that we can fill out whatever paperwork might need to be done for you to get this process started. Next slide. So if anyone is on who's done a um, food challenge with me, you know that I do a food allergy boot camp with my older adolescents. So it's really about self-management and self-advocacy. So starting with epinephrine, um, always carry epinephrine, carry your tube back. You're responsible for having your epinephrine at, at college. Uh, it's not in the nurse's office. It's not in your teacher's desk. It's your responsibility to carry it. And for some people that is new and others are really have been carrying it always. Uh, have an additional tube pack in your room so that you have a backup fill your prescriptions before you go to school and consider identifying a local pharmacy for any kind of refills you might need when you're at school. Advance. Um, epinephrine is your friend, really. Uh, my, my two sons with food allergies used to call it the epi friend. Um, if you think you need to use it, we really like for people to use it. You, you know, just think about that, that if you're in this situation, you're, you're thinking you should use it, you should. And then multiple states have passed legislation that allows undesignated epinephrine in public venues. Undesignated means it's not a prescri prescription for a specific person. It is available, say, if it was like at a baseball game. Massachusetts is not one of these states. And then um, under that multiple state legislation, um, that is also includes colleges if they choose to do show so, but they're not required to. And then several states have passed legislation that's specific for colleges. Uh, and again, the colleges have the option of doing it or not. And I don't have my notes um, from this view, but it's um, maybe like seven states that have done this. And again, it's not Massachusetts. But you know, anybody who's a political science major might want to take on some of this. There's been a lot of food allergy legislation, and it's great because it starts out grassroots, and, and a lot of things have changed because of this legislation. Uh, advance, advance. So dining out, um, Yamini talked a little bit about this. So a lot of kids with food allergies aren't used to eating out, uh, but know that going to college, a lot of activities around, um, social activities revolve around eating food. So have a plan and um, 
Maria will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I do wanna mention a couple of other things. If you're ever served a meal that contains your allergen, like your, you have a hamburger and it has cheese on it and you know you're allergic to milk, keep that plate and ask them to send you a new order so that they're not just scraping off the cheese. So like one of those little helpful hint things. And then Massachusetts has a restaurant law um, that makes us a safer place to eat out. And it will have the posting on the menus, on the when you walk into the restaurant. But behind that, there's also training for uh, food allergy in the restaurants. And then there's certified food protection managers. Next slide. And the only states that have similar legislation are Illinois, Maryland, Michigan, Rhode Island, Virginia, and New York City and um, St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. So if you go to school, say in California, eating out will be a very different experience than it is in Massachusetts. So just be extra careful that um, if you've gotten used to it here, it's very different in other states. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, reading labels. So the Food Allergen Labeling Consumer Protection Act is the uh, act that mandates reporting the top eight food allergens. Sesame is gonna be added in 2023 uh, and again, much food at school is eaten, eaten outside of the caf cafeteria, so read all your labels. And I have our little Twix, uh, right Twix, left Twix up here. Um, because in different parts of the country, the same food that you eat that is safe here may not be safe there because of different manufacturing facilities. So read labels all the time. Next. All right, so intimate kissing that um, Yamini talked a little bit about. Um, Yes, it's awkward, but it would be way more awkward to have a reaction because you didn't share information with your partner. Uh, and it is not an uncommon thing to have symptoms from infant kissing. Uh, also things like sharing straws and glasses and utensils, you should be careful with as well. Um, so starting with communication about your food allergy, maybe having a planned date night where your partner doesn't eat food that you're allergic to, but you know, life is spontaneous. So uh, in the event that your partner ate something, that you're allergic to. There's been several studies that looked at the amount of an allergen in saliva. And this is kind of an old one, but it seems to have stood the test of time. So they gave uh, subjects uh, who were not allergic to peanut, they gave them uh, peanut butter, and then they measured how much peanut protein was in the saliva at different intervals and with different interventions. So they had them brush their teeth and then they measured and then they had them um, rinsed their mouth and they measured, they had them chew gum and they measured, and there was still peanut um, protein present. So what they found, uh, next slide, is that the most effective intervention was to, to remove any kind of allergen, was to wait at least several hours and eat, an, eat a non-peanut containing food. And that was what turned out to be the safest um, to remove the, the peanut protein. So that's just a little helpful hint that if you know your partner is eating, so, eating something, then waiting longer and um, having them eat something not containing your allergen is really the safest way to go. And then a little bit about um, alcohol, recreational drugs or illicit drugs. So we're not condoning the use, but I want to give you some really important information about that. Um, alcohol can contain allergens. Alcohol is not part of that Food Allergen Labeling Consumer Protection Act that I mentioned. Um, allergens do not have to be listed on alcohol. Bars also have little or no food allergy training. It is a place where there are allergens, things like egg whites and, and uh, milk. So it's not a place like if you've eaten at a restaurant, that's fine. If you go to a bar, it, it can be very different, especially a bar that is not associated with a restaurant. And as far as alcohol, um, recreational drugs or illicit drugs, they impair judgment, they lower inhibitions and you do things that you know maybe you wouldn't otherwise do. Uh, they can make communicating more difficult. And alcohol um, is, is kind of unique and something to really um, remember that having alcohol and eating a, a food that you're allergic to can result in a more rapid and more severe reaction, even with a lower amount of the allergen. So it is called a cofactor and it can really boost that reaction much faster. So knowing that is important. And then impaired judgment affects your decision-making and things like you know when to seek help, when to give yourself happy. Um, we didn't talk a lot about 
particular epinephrine devices, we're always available for you to reach out to us, especially when we see on the poll that there are some people who are not comfortable, but happy to do any coaching. Uh, and we really think that you've got this. Um, we want all of our kids with food allergies to do everything that their peers do, but with a little more preparation, maybe a little less spontaneity, you should be able to travel abroad, uh, do exchange programs. Um, we, we don't put limits on our patients with food allergies. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any um, questions. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa, that was great. Um, a lot of useful tips. I think a bonus poll question should be, who can name the movie that that GIF came from? I'm wondering how this pop, how this uh, age group might do with that. I see Sam is shaking his head no. Lady and the Tramp, man, Lady and the Tramp, classic. Um, I thought you were talking about the meme at the end with the baby. I was like, I don't recognize uh, that baby. <laughs> but you're right, the gift, yeah. No, I, I can recognize that one. <laughs> um, great. Jess, you have another poll for us? I think we're jumping straight into Maria's presentation. Oh, my mistake. Sorry. No, you're good. All right. Hope everyone can see the slides. OK, um, so I'm just so happy to be spending a little time with you all this evening. Um, and and um, like folks mentioned in the introductions, a big part of my job is supporting kids and teenagers and young adults who are managing food allergies as they navigate all sorts of transitions in life. Um, and as exciting as transitions can be, they can also come with some challenges, especially um, for young people who are managing different medical considerations. So with that in mind, I just wanted to kind of start off by acknowledging that the transition to college is a major one. Um, and we often romanticize the idea of going off to college without creating enough space to ask questions or to let ourselves experience a range of emotions. Um, I've worked with a lot of um, high school seniors who are hesitant to let anyone know that they're feeling nervous about starting college um, because of this huge pressure to be like nothing but totally happy and psyched. Um, you know, this is gonna be the best four years of my life and there's kind of this pressure around it. So I think it's important to give ourselves permission to let go of some of that pressure and to really be on, honest and genuine like with ourselves and also with the people who care about us. And from what I've seen when we can do that, it really sets us up to have a, a much smoother experience and enjoy this thing that you've worked so hard for, right? Getting into college and going off on your own. So like Dr. Rakud was saying at the beginning, um, as we think about navigating this major transition, the most important recommendation we can make is to have a plan in place so you can feel as comfortable and as prepared as possible. And some pieces of this plan can really be set into motion well before you even step foot on campus for the first time. So you can start off by practicing some key skills over the next few months. Um, for example, if your parent is usually the one to talk to a restaurant employee about your food allergies, you can practice taking the lead on this and advocating for yourself the next time you go out to eat. Um, if your parent is the one to manage all your prescriptions and doctor's appointment scheduling, right, um, you can take on the responsibility of contacting the pharmacy this summer to be sure that your refills are, are kind of all set to go. You can take on the responsibility of, you know, scheduling your next doctor's appointment or making sure the contact information is switched in the medical record system to your cell phone number. Um, and so um, when we kind of practice these things in advance, it can be a really nice chance to troubleshoot with a safety net in place if things don't go as smoothly as you'd hope the first time. Um, and I think that can be really helpful. Um, and you can also do some advanced thinking about how you'll navigate the new experiences that you might come across in college. So, at, you know, like other folks have mentioned, if you're planning to attend a party, it's important to be proactive so you don't end up in a stressful or frustrating situation. So you need to think about carrying your epinephrine with you, you know, make, how are you gonna remind yourself to do that, where you're gonna carry it and how. Um, you need to decide, am I gonna plan to eat at this place, you know, I'm going to? Um, if so, what do I need to do to feel good about that? If I don't feel comfortable eating there, you know, I need to plan ahead and eat beforehand. Um, so 
you can do some thinking and before you even get to college about how you might approach those different situations um, so that it doesn't all feel brand new and it doesn't kind of sneak up on you. When we manage food allergies, everyone talks about this idea of needing to be careful, um, but I think this can feel like a vague or confusing idea, right? Um, so in our food allergy clinic, we talk a lot about the concept of being careful on a continuum. So on one end of the continuum, we think about examples when someone is not careful enough. Um, so for example, if they forget or choose not to bring their epinephrine along to a social event, or if they eat something at a friend's house without asking, you know, whether it contains their allergen or telling their friend about an allergen. And then all the way at the other end of the continuum, we think of examples of being really, really careful. So like when someone might avoid eating outside of their home or skip social events altogether because of their food allergies. So I think it can be helpful to think about finding a middle ground between the two ends of this continuum. So you're taking all the necessary steps that you know how to take to keep yourself safe without feeling like um, food allergies are starting to get in the way of the things that you want to do or the things that you have to do in college. So if you choose to kind of live away um, at school, a lot of times you have to eat in the dining hall. And so it's important to figure out how to, how to navigate that and find that middle ground for yourself. So if we think about, you know, for example, going out to a brand new restaurant with friends, maybe a restaurant in a different state that has different policies in place, like Lisa was referencing, that middle ground could take a lot of different forms, right? It might look like calling the restaurant in advance to let them know about your allergies and asking questions about how they handle allergies and, and what menu items might be a good option for you. Um, it might look like bringing your epinephrine with you to the restaurant, telling your friends about your allergies so they're kind of aware of things like sharing food while you're together, um, and then really kind of confirming all the information when you're ordering with the restaurant staff in person. Um, and then if we think about that same example on the not careful enough end of the continuum, you would think about going to the restaurant with your friends but not taking any of those steps because maybe you're hesitant to kind of speak up or you're feeling shy or awkward about it. So that, that's, from my perspective, maybe not being careful enough. Um, and then again, on the really, really careful end, um, it, you might say, okay, I'm just gonna skip this all together and make up an excuse to stay home. So our goal is to try to find that, that middle ground. Um, and having a clear plan in place can really help you feel comfortable doing that. Um, and, and it's important to know that it looks different for everybody. So there are no right or wrong answers um, in terms of how to figure that out and, and find something that feels comfortable for you. Um, another major component of this plan um, is to think about communication with people who care about you. So when you manage food allergies, it's really important to have a support system in place and not feel like you're handling everything on your own. Um, and again, sometimes there's this pressure or expectation to feel like I'm going off to college now, like, you know, I have to handle this by myself or there's, you know, it would be embarrassing to talk to someone about it or to ask for help, but we know that that's not true and we really hope that you don't feel that way. So important to have a support system. And at the same time, we recognize, right, that you might not want to feel like you have to tell every single new person you meet at college about your food allergies, right? And so um, we don't want it to feel like the thing that defines you or the first thing you have to say um, in any new situation. So for this reason, you know, it can be helpful to think about mapping out different communication plans for people who play different roles in your life, right? Um, so sometimes I call this the circles of trust or the circles of intimacy diagram um, because it's helpful to think about it in that way if we want to wrap our minds around who should know what and when, essentially. Um, so you'll see here with this little diagram, which is just kind of a, you know, made up version, you could think about this in lots of different ways. But if you thought about the, yourself in the center um, circle, that next layer out, the, the kind of that innermost um, circle that's closest to you, represent the people who need to know a lot of the details about your food allergies and how your management is going. So this could include your parents or guardians um, and your medical team. And it can be really helpful to talk to your family about the communication expectations when you're at college like how often you'll be in touch, what's the right balance between sending a quick text and having a longer kind of check-in or debrief phone call or video call. 
um, what details you'll share with them about like what you're eating and how that's going. Um, and then if you were to experience an allergic reaction, even a minor one, what information would be shared with your family and when, right? Um, and again, maybe tying back to things folks have already said about um, waivers and forms that you'd need to fill out um, on the college end. Um, and so thinking this through in advance can really prevent extra stress or frustration, especially when there's a big mismatch between your expectations as a college student and your family's expectations. So I've seen a lot of examples where you know, um, a student will be at school and a parent will send a text message asking about, you know, how um, eating in the dining hall went that day or how that new restaurant was. And the student doesn't respond to the text message because they're busy or distracted or they don't feel like it. And then the parent starts to worry. So they'll send many more text messages or maybe even call many times. And it just turns into a lot of um, stress and sometimes some conflict. And so getting ahead of it by having those conversations before you go off to school um, can be really, really helpful. Next level out in the circle might include people like roommates or close friends, coaches, res um, resident advisors. These are the people at college who will regularly be supporting you in navigating your food allergies. And so they don't need to know as much as like your family or your medical team, but they may need to know some details about your allergies and how you plan on managing them. Um, and these can also be the people who help you kind of enact those plans that you make, right? Um, by reminding you to bring your epi when you're leaving the dorm or just kind of being that safety net in some way when you're on campus. Um, the next level out from there could be friends or classmates or other people who, have, uh, who know you have food allergies but might not have any of the details, right? So these are the people you might casually mention your allergy to, like if they invite you to go check out the ice cream social, you know, down the hall in the dorm or offer to grab you a coffee on the way to class, right? You know, you might share pieces of the information with them in those specific situations. Um, and then there's this outermost circle, which could be people you meet in college who don't need to know about your food allergies at all, right? Like someone you're kind of taking um, one class with and see once a week and just chat with for a couple of minutes, you know, or some professors that you, you know, don't have super close relationships with. Um, maybe, you know, you choose not to disclose anything about your food allergies with them and that's okay. Um, so again, like if I ask each of you to fill this out, your circles might look really different. So no right and wrong answers, just some ideas and some tools to get us all thinking. Um, as part of the conversation about having a plan, I also just wanted to briefly talk about stress management. Um, so it's really common to experience stress um, at different points throughout your time in college. And it's just important to know what works for you in terms of managing that stress. Um, so in general, I think taking care of yourself and prioritizing that is super important. Um, so making time to eat nutrition, nutritious meals. Um, and this is especially important when you have food allergies because there might be extra steps you need to take to make this happen, right? So it's okay to have kind of, you know, some go-to like protein bar type things in your bag as a backup, but if you're just kind of living off of those for days at a time because you're too busy to kind of sort out finding a meal that's safe for you, you know, that's where you'd wanna step back and reprioritize, right? Um, along the same lines, getting rest is really important. So I always recommend prioritizing sleep and having a good sleep routine. Um, we can add exercise to the list because we know physical activity can really help to relieve stress. Um, there are a lot of great mind-body interventions that can be helpful for managing stress. So ranging from things like yoga or meditation to like quick breathing exercises that you can implement on the go, um, even like when you're taking a test or something like that. And then for sure, a key component of stress management is having people to talk to. So this can be tricky, um, especially when you're first getting to college and not sure who you feel comfortable, comfortable with, who you can trust. Um, so in the first semester, I think it's good to identify those go-to people um, in, like at school, at college, and also to know who's available from home, friends from home, um, family members you can reach out to as needed. And there might be times when stress starts to feel overwhelming and these day-to-day -day strategies just aren't really cutting it. And if that's the case, I'd recommend seeking out your school's counseling center um, and counseling services are available to most um, to students at, on most campuses. 
Um, and this is also a place they can help connect you with other resources if needed too. So they tend to be a really great place if you're needing a little more support once you get there. Um, and then going along with this theme of managing stress and having a good plan in place, I wanted to put in my pitch um, for this new transitions program we're getting up and running at Mass General. Um, so you don't have to be an MGH patient to join, um, but we're kind of hosting it through our clinic. Um, and it's an opportunity for young adults with food allergies to just get together with peers and talk about some of the topics that might be on your minds. Um, we're gonna have virtual meetings every couple of months. So it's not a big time commitment, tentatively planning for Wednesday evenings, just like this. Um, and we'll have some guest speakers, give presentations. We'll have some discussion where you can kind of get feedback from peers or give support to peers. Um, and then we'll have some time to set goals for ourselves. So we're, um, we're really wanting to help with some skills and knowledge um, that we can pass along you know, um, to you all and that you can share with one another as you really start to manage your allergies more independently as an adult. Um, so if you're interested in signing up, you can email the email address there um, and um, we'll get you more details about the first meeting. And I will pop it as soon as I stop sharing my screen into the chat as well um, in case anyone is, is interested. Um, so thank you for kind of taking some time to listen to me. And I just wanted to say a big congratulations for all the work you've put in, not only for, you know, throughout high school, for the college process, but also managing allergies along the way and navigating friend stuff and family stuff. It's a lot um, and um, you're, you're doing it, right? So just like Lisa said, we, we have full faith that um, you've got this and we're here to support you along the way. Thank you so much, Maria. That was fabulous. Um, Jess is going to show us a couple of poll questions now. Yep, and I'll go ahead. This is kind of piggybacking off of how prepared we feel to be at social events, how comfortable we feel reading labels on our own, how comfortable we feel talking about our food allergy with our friends, um, and then how often does the, your food allergy impact the social events that you attend? So I'll give just a minute for people to be able to answer these questions and then we'll show the results. So listening to Lisa and Maria, you know, kind of present a lot of um, um, really interesting information, I was, I was kind of reflecting on, you know, this idea that you're, there's a lot of social events to go to and how alcohol can be a cofactor for reactions. And it, you know, it reminded me of a couple of experiences that some of my college age um, patients had had in that they had a couple of cofactors happen at the same time. So maybe a cold, you know, exposure to the cold, a viral illness, alcohol, exercise, sometimes a couple of these things happen at the same time. Um, and that can really kind of really sharply precipitate an allergic reaction. So I was just kind of remembering that. And uh, I thought that was a really good, big, big point to bring up. And then Maria, I thought your presentations of the circles of trust really fit so beautifully with that experience that Yamini had, had shared with us earlier. Um, and, you know, kind of really mirrored that beautifully in terms of, you know, how you engage the people around you with your food allergies. Uh, Jess, how are we doing? We're doing well. I think we have a good quorum here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and end the poll and then share the results. Um, and just looking through, I'm glad that we're talking through the stuff and hopefully we're answering some of these questions tonight, but it feels like we have a range of answers and this group of poll questions, especially about how prepared we feel about going to social events, ranging from not prepared at all to feeling very prepared. Um, same thing with the other three questions as well, kind of a range of somewhat to very comfortable on reading labels and going grocery shopping, on talking about food allergies with friends. I'm glad that at least everyone's feeling somewhat comfortable um, to mostly comfortable, very comfortable, and then how often it impacts the fact that, you know, most of the time and some of the time for all the participants. So no one was feeling that all the time that it was impacted and then not at all being impacted. So we're at least having some social events being not attended because of our food allergies. This, this is kind of, you know, highlights the importance of kind of discussing these, um, these topics right now, especially in this forum and, and hearing from everyone's different viewpoints and perspectives and experiences with this. So we're going to move on now to uh, Krista and Karen's presentation. Thanks so much for joining us today. Terrific, thank you. Uh, 
I, it's, so, it's so fascinating to get to be part of this conversation. I'm really grateful to, to hear um, the perspective of all this, um, all, you know, those of you who are caring for uh, patients, we're coming at it from a different side. So, uh, you know, as you listen to us talk, I want you to think about how you're going to approach the college that you are about to attend. And we're, we sort of want to bring a little, shed a little light on um, what that is like. So, um, Karen, if you don't mind, go ahead. So, so it's the administrator's perspective, right? We are so excited to welcome each of you to our campuses. And, you know, we manage... We work with students every day who are managing food allergies and we are, you know, our doors are wide open, our kitchens are wide open. We're eager to show you what, what, um, what we have available to support you. Uh, we wanna empower you. It's really our goal to make you as independent as humanly possible. And, you know, they call this hospitality. This is welcoming. We're excited to have you. Um, but in there, there's a formal process that we talked about, right? There's some legal documentation for you to complete um, to notify the university about your needs. And that just empowers us to better support you, frankly. Um, when you come in and you fly under the radar at college and we don't know that you have a food allergy, it, it closes the doors to a huge number of resources. And Karen will talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, yes, there's this formal process, but there's also an informal process that we wanna really encourage you to engage in with your dining program, right? For us, food is about love, it's about passion, it's about community, it's about convening. And, and so it's important for us to get to know you on a personal level as well not just what you're allergic to, but what you like or don't like. Those weigh heavily on how we'll support you. Karen, you can go ahead and flip. You wanna change, Karen? Um, so while we're, while we're hoping for the computer to catch up, um, you know, I, I, I just wanna encourage you to talk to us, right? And, and we went through all of the ADA part. There is this very structured um, process that we talked about, the, you know, and there are different names for these offices, right? They don't always have the same name. Um, you know, we call it the Accessible Education Office, somebody else might call it Disability Services, so on. And, and this idea of documenting your food allergy begins this process. But it's important for me to say to you, it would be lovely to think that we all talked well to each other, but we don't. At a, at a college or university, especially as they get larger, it's important for you to self-advocate and connect with the various different parties, right? Not just the office that is um, putting together your accommodation, but the dining services team, the health services team, the residential team who will help make sure that you are safe when you're not in the dining hall, things like that. Um, Karen, you can go ahead. Thank you, Krista. You bet. So I also just want to echo the uh, what was mentioned earlier, that it's really important for you to take that formal accommodation of identifying with your college and university. Not only does it allow you to conduct formally with dining services, but it really opens up a greater network of support services for you. One example would be if you're a student athlete, perhaps that office is going to help commun formally communicate that your food allergies to the athletics department to ensure that there's appropriate meals for you for away games, um, safe options for you for the refueling table. And also another reason um, to ensure you register formally with the college and university is if you, if you do it your first year, many colleges and universities, their policy is to carry that accommodation through for all four years. So you just have to register once and perhaps just check in each semester or each new academic year to ensure that accommodation is in place. And, and more personally, from a dining perspective, we take that data and we 
you use that to appropriately gauge needs and resources. And when I say needs and resources, that could be built in accommodations based on the data we have about the number of students that have food allergies, say to peanuts, tree nuts. And we'll, I'll address more about this when I share with you some of the accommodations across college campuses. Again, another encouragement for you to start this process as soon as possible. Um, most colleges have a commitment date of May 1st. So I encourage you to perhaps reach out to that college or university within two weeks of that date, because that time with registering with disability services and then further connecting with dining to ensure that there's an accommodation plan there to support you could possibly take up to two to three weeks. So again, we encourage you to register and identify as early as possible. So now I wanna share with you examples of tools and resources and accommodations from dining that may be um, open to you at your college and university. Many, one of the most important tools is the online menu. Um, most schools are still in session now. So if you're considering different colleges, this is a great time to just actually go to the dining website and see if this is available and sort of navigate and get practice on this. So the online menu will typically have listed items that are scheduled to be served for each meal period. They may also include nutritional information, ingredients, sub-ingredients, quick icons that identify vegetarian or vegan options. And there may be a function to filter for containing or filter out allergens. Um, also, the dining hall will have menu cards and more of a quick reference at the point of service. And they may not actually contain all the ingredients or sub-ingredients and may only list top allergens, top eight allergens and gluten. On my next slide, I have an example for you. So as you can see here on the left side, that is actually an example of the Harvard Dining Services online menu. You can see what is being offered. And if you click on, on one of the, the links, it will open up um, to what would be on the right side there, some detailed information. But remember now, not all dining halls will offer some of the detailed ingredient information. So that's when we encourage you to really connect with your team and ask for that information. And as you can see here, also we encourage um, planning. Most online menus are available one week out or seven days out. And then the middle is just an example of that menu card or menu identifier. As you can see, um, Harvard Dining Services provides ingredient information. We um, flag for top eight allergens and gluten. And other examples and tools that may be available on your college campus. Some colleges have designated free from areas, stations or dining hall. What I mean by that is they may have an area that um, might be like a pantry where there might be nut free, nut -free desserts, there may be um, allergen free um, items that you can access like gluten free bread. Um, other dining halls may have stations where they serve breakfast, lunch and dinner that may be a, a station that's free, free of top eight allergens or one I'm familiar with from a, a prior university is free of um, top seven, but they have fish, they serve fish there. Or there are actually college and universities that have a free from dining hall, where they have a dining hall that's free of all tree nuts and peanuts or um, even any of the top allergens. And many dining halls will procure specialty products for you. For instance, um, we, we're very comfortable with the Enjoy Life products because they're free of top eight allergens. So you might see that. Um, in your dining hall in that pantry area, or they, these might be things you have to ask for when you're discussing with dining your accommodation plan. Other accommodations in, the, in terms of a self-serve environment is requesting items that are from the back of the house. What I mean by that is most dining halls will have a salad bar. If you're not comfortable eating from a salad bar because you're concerned for cross contact, many dining halls will have that built-in accommodation where you can ask someone in dining, may you have something that's um, back of the house, which means they would go into that refrigerator that's right near the salad bar and take, take the ingredients from that refrigerator for you. And also along the lines of a salad bar, there are dining halls that do what we call zoning. They may um, strategically place foods in the, on the salad bar where all the, I call them the ingredients are whole foods that don't need a nutrition label, where all the lettuce, the leafy greens, the tomatoes, the cucumbers are all together 
and the proteins are together. So that's where the egg may be, the tuna fish might be. So they tend to zone them in different areas to sort of support your comfort level and also to um, help with keeping decreasing uh, cross contact. But I encourage you that if you're not comfortable with that, to just please speak up and let dining know your comfort level with those types of accommodation. And something that is available at many dining halls is um, having um, dining help pair separately prepare meals for you. And that may come um, with advance notice where you may be emailing a particular email address to dining, or it may be an app. But most of the times this type of accommodation will require advance notice, typically, um, 24 hours advance notice so the dining hall can connect with you if they're if there are they have questions or if they're might, you may be asking for an item that um, might not be in stock that way they can rectify that and get back to you and ensure that you have a safe nourishing meal available to you other um other thoughts that i think are important is we have additional dietary needs to communicate that to dining Re religious dietary needs or um, um, you may have diabetes, so you might want lower carb options or carb controlled options, or you may be a plant-based eater and you're eat more of a vegetarian, vegan lifestyle. It's so please share that information with dining. And I have a note here about um, most accommodations are focused on residential dining. What I mean by that is in the dining hall, as opposed to the retail, which might be that food court that's on campus. And the reason behind that is that sense of community is in the dining hall where you meet up with your friends and eat. And sometimes that's also structured around meal plans and the meal plans are focused on meal swipes in the dining hall. So that's where the, why there's a majority of the accommodations are found in the dining hall and the residential dining hall. Um, also in terms of retail, a lot of them might be national brands or franchises. And there's um, sort of a tight regulation of what they can do to accommodate. Um, luckily, a lot of the national um, franchises have accommodations that are friendly and welcoming to students with food allergies, but there may be a, a part that there may be programs that not be able to modify things. Um, so just keep that in mind. And this is a question I get all the time from um, students with or without allergies. Um, what meal plan should I select? It really depends on your school. There are some schools that make it easy where this question won't come up because there's only one meal plan. They all, are you care to eat unlimited plan? But if you have a choice of different meal plans, especially as a first year student, think about it. Think about your dietary pattern. If you're a person who doesn't eat breakfast, perhaps you don't need every single meal for that week. If you're an athlete, perhaps your needs are great and you need to eat throughout the day. But also think about the meal plans where there are many meal plans where there are meal swipes and there's also um, points. So if the points allow you to give you flexibility where you can use those points at a C store, where you can stock up on some safe snacks for your room, consider that. But with all those phases, if it's too much for you or you're thinking it's overwhelming when you first get there because you're, you're trying to figure out your schedule or you might even think about things like, oh, I. I go to school locally and might go home on the weekends or I have an internship or a part-time job. Think about that too. However, um, most schools and um, colleges and universities will allow you to switch your meal plan usually one time during the school year. So if you're unsure, there's always that, that sort of um, backup plan of figuring it out. And then if it doesn't work out, switch the meal plan. So there's two trends I wanted to share. I think it's important to share with students with food allergies that are on college and university campuses. This is significant focus on plant-based options. And what that might mean is, um, yes, there might be whole foods that are easy to identify, like things like beans, plant-based options, but then there's also um, meat alternatives, such as the beyond, the impossible, which may contain some of your food allergens. So just be aware of that. Um, they do, we've, in my experience in the last two or three years, I've had students identify with me reporting allergic reactions after consuming these products. So just use that online menu, look at the ingredients. If you're unsure, please um, ask Dining about, about what the ingredients might be, what products we have. Another trend is that um, with more, the campuses being more diverse, we, 
you support our program that way is there are more globally inspired dishes. So the culinary, our chefs are using authentic ingredients, spices, seasonings, and different methods of pre preparation that you may be unfamiliar, unfamiliar with. It. So please ask, inquire about that. And so it goes back to what um, Yamini, Dr. Vakun has said is that if there's something that looks unfamiliar, please ask, communicate with us. We do want you to partake and enjoy these options safely. And my last slide is just a summary of some of the things that have been presented. We encourage you to identify and register with the appropriate office and departments early and follow through. When I mean follow through, um, check in with them. If you submitted your documentation, a lot of times that documentation might be submitted through a secure portal and there could be technical glitches where it might not have gone through. So check in with that office to ensure your application is complete because many of the offices will not review the application until the, the file is complete. Um, please be prepared to share with us your food story. When I say food story, you may be um, prepared to tell us some of the things you eat, the things you like to eat, the brand you use at home, what are the foods you avoid. Share that with us because that provides a better understanding for dining so that we can better support you. Also have some reasonable expectations regarding their accommodation plan. Um, for many of our students, we work out a plan and it's smooth sailing from the beginning. But for a handful of students, that might not be the case. Um, we want, if it's not working out within the first week or two, please let us know, communicate that with us so we can tweak that plan. So, and last but not least, most importantly, we wanna meet and commune with you on a regular basis. We wanna know how you're doing. We wanna build that strong relationship with you so that we can carry you through all four years. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you both. Uh, a lot of interesting content and it's generated some questions um, that I think we'll uh, defer for now. I, I think particularly interested uh, to hear from you guys if there's time at the end about, you know, when a prospective student should engage with you guys on, on a lot of these questions. But I think we should get to the start of the show. Uh, Sam, someone who's actually got the lived experience uh, right now. It's fresh and current. Um, Sam, bring us home. Uh, let's all right, hi you. everyone. Uh, my name is Sam. Um, I'm going to try to keep it a little bit short just because we're uh, running out of time, but I, I want to save some time to answer some questions as well. Um, so uh, my allergy experience. Uh, so the quick things about me, um, I go to UMass Amherst. I'm a current freshman studying mechanical engineering. I like to play um, club Frisbee here. I also am a camp counselor at a camp called Camp Yavana in New Hampshire in the summers. So my journey with allergies, um, I started at a very young age, uh, at the age of one. So I've been doing it for a while now. Um, I started with a lot of a lot of restrictions. I was allergic to all tree nuts, peanuts, dairy, eggs, um, et cetera. And over the years, it has um, gone down through a lot of food challenges with Dr. Tipas and Lisa, as we heard from earlier tonight. Um, and so that's been really great. I've outgrown a lot of things like eggs, like um, milk. Um, so our current allergies right now are peanuts and then most tree nuts, um, specifically cashews and pistachios, um, which I had a great experience with Lisa in January, figuring out which required two EpiPens, which I could get to later on in the, in the presentation. Um, so that is my journey with allergies. So when I'm deciding to come to school, um, if you guys don't know, UMass Amherst has been number one best campus food the past five years, um, which one thing about that comes with, they're really good about labeling their food, really good about nutrition, really good about communicating um, to their students. So it was a little bit of a factor when I chose to come here. Um, I had come here a, a few times because my older sister is also a student here. So I'd been to dining halls already. already. I knew I could eat there. Um, and I went with the same things when I went to visit other schools, I always would check out the dining hall, you know, look at their resources. Um, but ultimately what it comes down to, as we've heard throughout the night, is just self-advocacy. Like you are your, your best advocate when you're here at school. Um, so you need to advocate for yourself and you can do that wherever you go, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a, any dining hall, when you make your college decision. So here's an example um, of, of UMass's kind of system, pretty much everywhere you see food in a dining hall, there's a sign 
that has most of the nutritional information, but most importantly, it's actually a little blurry, but this last line, um, it has all allergens. I wanna say it's more than just a top eight because um, you see things like wheat here. Um, so right here, it says tree nuts. And then also because it's a major seven allergen or major eight allergen, you have this bigger sign that says contain nuts. So I've seen contain sesame, contains shellfish, those bigger signs in addition. Um, so one important thing to note is um, this is right next to another dessert. So um, if you're really you know nervous about that, um, like using the same the same server, um, you can always you know communicate that with the dining hall and ask for something from the back. So with that comes communication. Um, I'm wearing my medical air bracelet on my wrist, um, which is something that I've always done my whole life, but it's really important here in college. One, just because in the case of emergency, people need to know you're having allergic reaction. But two, people always ask me about it. You know, when I meet someone, they see it, they go, oh, what is that for? It's a really easy way to be like, oh, actually, I'm allergic to peanuts and tree nuts. Um, and it's a good conversation to start over about that. Um, and it's, as I said earlier, it's really important. Um, so communication with my family, um, we're pretty good about talking about things in general and allergies come with that as well. Um, so I recommend um, definitely doing that, having a plan with, with, with your parents. And then friends, um, similarly, when I, when I moved in with my roommate, you know, I mentioned that I had um, food challenge, uh, not food challenges, food allergies, because um, I've walked into some, some dorm rooms where people have peanut butter, you know, all out. People who eat peanut butter, like right before bed, they stick a spoonful in their mouth. So communicating that with your roommate, I think is very important. Also with their close friends. So, you know, if they have something like peanut butter, they don't come up to you, give you a big, huge hug. Um, and down to the bottom row, um, always read whatever you do, you know, always read warnings. Um, there have been times when UMass has um, a, a rice dish that has almonds in it somehow. Um, so don't just always look at something, always check the warning. Uh, and then communicating with restaurants definitely, I think, is my biggest kind of challenge here. It's not, it's totally doable. It's just the one thing, like, I really have amazing experiences here at dining halls. So I like to kind of stick there. So restaurants I do, I do less often. Um, but it's still very doable. My most common thing is just to do research. Uh, if I know I'm going to a pizza place, I pull up on my phone, look at the menu online, look up, does this place, is this place good with allergens? Usually you'll see an allergen menu. Um, you can just see if there's any like nuts in the menu in general or whatever your allergen is and see what, what you're, what you're going to expect when you get there. It makes the whole process a lot less stressful. And the last thing is, you know, asking questions like, even if you think some, as as we heard a lot earlier, even if you think something is um, something is is okay, you should always double check because um, it can't hurt, and no one's gonna ask for you. You're the only person who can ask that question who will remember. So make sure just to ask questions, but and uh, make sure you trust your answer uh, before you actually eat the food. So this is um, an example of something that we have heard from, like the Harvard group, um, being in contact with the with the dining services. So I got this email one day, um, pretty much telling me to stay away from one of the dining halls because they were having a pistachio night, um, which I thought was really funny, but it was really important because um, you know, I would not have known necessarily that this was going on and I had a test that night. So I definitely didn't want to go into there right before a test and have an allergic reaction. Um, so, it was, so being on this on the dining halls list, getting these emails was really helpful for me to stay safe and eat, eat food that night before an important test. So supplies, as we've heard today, is extremely important. Um, my system is whenever I go home, I make sure, or whenever I go home before coming back to school, I make sure that I have EpiPens that will last me until my next time coming home. And then my mom helps me get those EpiPens. Thank you to her. Um, so that's my system. There's plenty of other ways you could do it, such as getting ones from local pharmacy, um, near your school. And then Zyrtec and Benadryl, I also always have um, stocked up in my room. Uh, making sure those don't expire is, is, is important. And the drawstring bag is my go-to. Um, I am very good about not going anywhere without it. Um, my drawstring bag has EpiPens and Zyrtec and Benadryl. Um, so you'll see me, you know, at parties wearing drawstring bags. You'll see me um, walking to work in, with a joshing bag on. It's in my backpack when I go to class, I throw my whole joshing bag in there. Um, that's what my system for, for carrying those around wherever I go. Um, and it's like, 
also a good conversation starter. People always ask, oh, it's in the bag. And it's, oh, you know, I have food allergies actually. That depends on my bag. Um, so, and then, yeah, everything actually was covered here. So some challenges, um, like I said, I think uh, restaurants can be the harder thing, um, but just doing research is, is the key. Um, there've been a few times where I've had, I've never had a, a bad exposure here, um, but I've had every once in a while I've gotten just a few hives. Um, so really it's really important to know your body. Um, so I know that when I get a hive in my cheek, it's from dairy, um, like too much milk. I know when I get like a hive, like on my arm, it could just be seasonal allergies. It could be just pressure. Um, so it's important to kind of recognize that and, you know, take a Zyrtec, you know, make sure it's not turning into anything more than that. Uh, maybe taking yourself out of the situation, um, going like with friends, but going somewhere else, somewhere more calm so you can just evaluate your, your body and see if you need anything more extreme. Um, planning ahead, like I said, is really key. Um, having having your pens, um, researching places before you go somewhere. Um, parties, I think, definitely can be scary because you have, a, well, at least for me, I've had this fear like, what if I'm in the middle of a party and I have a allergic reaction, I have to call 911 and everyone gets mad at me because I'm ruining the party and the everyone comes and it's a whole mess. And the reality is like, that's not a big worry. Um, um, you know, be safe, be careful. And if you have a allergic reaction, you know, take yourself away from the situation with friends, as Lisa said, um, and you can you can handle it as a group with, with the EpiPens if you need. Um, also one thing that um, I keep in mind is um, always be in a situation where you can, you know, ask for help. So if you're going somewhere like in the middle of the woods um, on a hike, like be extra careful about not taking food from anyone because you might be in the middle of the woods with no cell reception, which would be really bad. Um, so kind of adjusting your actions based on where you're going to be so you could get help if you needed it. Um, and then dating, as we heard a lot about, that can be scary. Definitely just communication. Um, don't be afraid to tell someone who you're with, hey, I'm allergic to peanut butter because they don't want to kill you. So definitely just being open about it and, and giving them enough of a chance to react, you know, four hours in advance or whatever, um, how many hours you want to stay ahead. And then my last thing I'm going to say is um, I really encourage if your doctor wants you to do a food challenge, do a food challenge. Um, I had never um, needed an EpiPen outside of my food challenges, um, which has been a really good experience, you know, knowing how to do it. So I did, I had one this past January where I needed two EpiPens for a pistachio and cashew food challenge. Um, I never really like thought, oh, what would I do if the first one didn't work? Like, obviously I knew I had two, but like when I actually give a second EpiPen, and that experience, you know, gives a lot of confidence going into a situation where if that started to happen, I would know like, okay, I know, I know I can, I'm going to be okay because I know I have two EpiPens. I know what, what I'm going to do. I'm going to call 911 and I know that after 30 minutes, I'm going to do a second one and I'm going to keep watching myself and this, it becomes a lot less scary once you have that experience. So I'm going to stop it here, but feel free to ask me a question in the chat or um, whatever the methods there are, the Q&A. And thank you so much. Damn, that was really great. Um, you know, one of the questions that came up as one of the written questions and something that I really wanted to hear a little bit more about is like, how did you exactly manage the communication with your roommates? <laughs> with the roommates? Um, yeah. I think just when we moved in, I, um, we like discussed like, oh, sharing snacks. It's like, oh, I might have been to snacks here. And by the way, just like I have food allergies. And it started as a simple, just like comment. And, you know, he asked, oh, like, what are you allergic to? And I said, oh, I'm allergic to this. Oh, what does that mean? Oh, it means this. You know, it's a lot of just like, going back and forth, you know, and let's just, and if, if for some reason you don't feel comfortable saying it right away, um, a lot of times it comes up and don't be afraid to kind of explain more than what maybe you were asked. Be like, oh yeah, I'm allergic to this. And that means that I can't eat it and I don't want you to eat it and give me a big hug after or whatever. Um, and I'll, you know, it's, it's, you have the right to your, to safety in your room. So don't feel like pressure and like, oh, but he loves peanut butter. Like, yeah, I want him to have it. Like, it's really important to be able to like come to your room and you know lay in your bed safely. So if you if you don't want him near your bed because um, because you're afraid that he touched peanut butter, like say that. Say actually, I prefer my side of the room be separate from yours. Um, if you're that nervous, just being clear about it. it. Sounds like it was kind of like a series of conversations. Yeah, if if if, if kind of as you see things come up, um, 
you know, life is love, the learning experiences, making mistakes and seeing how things go. So, you know, if you see one day, you know, he's, your roommate is, is, you know, maybe eating something on your, on your desk, maybe you then bring it up and say, actually, I prefer you not do that just because I have allergies um, and just kind of reacting to what happens. Yeah, no, that sounds, that sounds really great. And those concrete tips are so helpful, uh, especially when you're starting to think about getting used to living with a whole new person <laughs> that you've never met before. Um, you know, there were a couple of other questions. So we would love to hear questions from, you know, um, all the folks here that are joining us today. So either in the Q&A or in the chat, either place would be great. Um, we did have a couple of questions that have already been sent in. And so I think we can kind of get started with those or waiting for more questions to filter in. Um, so another question that came up, I'm just going to sort of plunge in is, you know, what should I look for with housing? Um, you know, what kind of accommodations, you know, sh what kind of preferences should I have? I think that's a really popular one that comes up. Um, Sam, I'm going to call on you again. And then there's a couple of other folks I'm going to call on too. Um, yeah. So I think anything is really doable. Um, I'm sort of, I've never been allergic that like being in the same room is a huge problem. So I can't say speak for, for those kind of allergies, but um, I think, you know, having a roommate is, it's doable if you communicate. Um, like I said, it may mean just saying, I prefer you not use my stuff essentially when it comes down to, um, or if you have peanut butter, please wash your hands or whatever, whatever you, your rules may be, just communicate your rules. Um, and also I know people who you know, live off campus or live in more apartment style places where they can cook their own food. So if, if you freshman year maybe don't feel like you're eating enough food, maybe you look more for sophomore year, junior year to live somewhere where you can make your own food. But um, that's something I don't have much experience in yet. I'm just a freshman and dining halls have worked so uh, very well for me so far. You know, Lisa, you, you had, um, you know, I've, I've had the fortune of being your sons too, and they're lovely. You know, you had the experience of having three children who had, you know, multiple food allergies. Do you want to comment a little bit? Sure, I would, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me, okay. So um, I would say like as a clinic, we generally don't advocate for our kids to have a single room. Um, we want them to have the roommate experience and feel like it's really doable. Um, but Matthew, who um, is actually now 30, when he went to a college in Texas, they were sort of taken aback by the number of food allergies he had. And they were, they said, we've really only dealt with kids with peanut allergy. And so they were wonderful. They could not have been better, uh, but very much to our surprise, when he moved in, he was in a single room next to the model room that they show prospective students. And then there was a break in the hall and then the rest of the hall and across from his room was the entrance. So he literally was all by himself at the end of the hall and he hated school. He absolutely hated it. And when he got home at Christmas, he said, I wanna transfer. And then uh, he, but he wanted to finish the year and the, um, there was a flood and they had to rearrange all the students. And so he ended up with sweet mates and he stayed the full four years and then two more years uh, working for the university after that. So uh, I, I do think being socially isolated like that is uh, it's just so uncomfortable and uh, much harder than having roommates for sure. So it is for many reasons, something we don't advocate a, a single room. And I'm gonna jump in from the hospitality side, right? Dining is where you get to meet people and sit to be together and, and um, discover people you, who aren't in your classes who, or who aren't in your, you know, on your team. So really working with your dining, dining team to ensure that you are included in that experience in a way that is um, comfortable and safe is important because that's uh, just such a vital space on campus. You know, um, in thinking about like sort of the shared experience, there's a lot of a lot of support structure. You know, in addition to dining services that really help um, you know students feel comfortable. I, I'm going to you know address a question that came up in the chat about you know, an RA and their role in sort of helping students with food allergy. And I'm actually going to call on Yamini, who has the dual experience of both, you know, having done college and medical school with food allergies, but also being an RA. Yeah. So that was actually, um, Harvard has an interesting experience where they have slightly older 
um, uh, RAs. They're called tutors and they're meant to be young faculty and grad students. And so I, you know, just a couple of years ago, I was in the dining hall experience getting to know a lot of the people on this, uh, on this panel. Um, and I would say absolutely. Um, there is a lot of college is learning how to be an adult. And the reason the RAs are there are to help you with that process. So not everybody is gonna need to know every aspect of this. And not every RA or tutor is gonna know how to handle food allergies, but they're gonna have the resources and the support network to find you that answer. So that first conversation may not be the perfect answer, but they're gonna know who to go to get you every single answer you need if you have not found those answers already. So I definitely think the RA or tutor, whatever it may be, whatever support network they have there is an important person to let know. In addition to that, the whole point of an RA or a tutor is to host study breaks. And a lot of those study breaks, the only way you can get a college student to go anywhere is to offer them food, free food. Um, and so that free food experience requires knowing what people are allergic to, what people are avoiding for religious or cultural reasons. And so they should already ideally be asking you what you're allergic to. But even if they're not, it's a good opportunity for you to advocate for yourself, like Sam said. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to chime in, it's a little bit of a side note, but Sam, you were talking about, you know, your roommates who love, you know, like eating peanut butter by the spoonful. And I have family members like that who love eating peanut butter by the spoonful. And then they take that peanut butter, put it on a sandwich and they take that same spoon and they stick it in something else, whether it's the jelly or the butter or the cream cheese or whatever it may be, you know? Um, things that I never would have even thought of. And now that other thing that you thought was safe for you is now contaminated. So I, my entire life, and it wasn't just roommates, it was family members, in-laws especially, had to do a lot of educating of how do you maintain, you know, like food when it comes to a food allergic individual and how do you reduce cross-contamination? And this has been incredibly difficult for me to handle with my in-laws. So I highly recommend having roommates because it's easier to practice those conversations, you know, the earlier you can. And so that the first time you're saying it is to a roommate and not, you know, the family of the person you love. <laughs> I feel like so much of the education we do around food allergy, you know, patients and parents, uh, even from a young age and all through transition to adulthood um, is such a good lesson that's generalizable as well, you know, like setting limits, uh, finding your place on sort of the, uh, you know, continuum um, that's healthy for you. I wanted to invite uh, Nancy and Jess, a couple of other panelists, if they, you know, want to reflect on anything they've heard tonight or amplify anything or add a question even. Sure, thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. This was really such an amazing um, panel of, of experts who could share their knowledge, which I hope is really helpful to um, all, the, all who are tuning in. I have to say, um, even though I've been doing this work for quite a while, I learned something every time. Um, so thank you. Um, I wanted to just follow up on something, Sam, that you said in your presentation was really great and so helpful. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, talking with your roommates and you mentioned talking um, no, talking about what your rules were. And I think everyone's going to have different rules and everyone manage their, manages their food allergies a little differently. Somebody might be comfortable, you know, with a peanut allergy, having peanut butter in the room under certain, you know, restrictions. Other people may say, you know what, this is my, this, this is my dorm room and this is the place that I, you know, would like to have be comfortable and safe without any, without ever having to worry. Um, and so I think just knowing what one's own sort of guidelines and rules are and being able to communicate that I think is really helpful. And I'm always a big fan of rehearsal. Um, so I, I do a lot of suggesting that um, children, then teenagers, and then young adults rehearse some of these skills um, before they go off to college or before they go off to independent living situations. Um, and then I just want to say one more thing, which is a really good tip, I think, that I learned um, from a family recently of a teenager, um, which is related to carrying one's EpiPen. And that is um, this particular um, person had gotten Apple, oh no, what it's called, AirTags. And so they had, um, and, and people who know technology better than me, who's old and doesn't know technology well, but um, with an iPhone, apparently you can get a little tag that you can put on something such as an EpiPen so that if you leave your house, and most 
most young people leave their house with their phones. It, it will signal you to go back and get whatever is tagged, like your EpiPen, which I thought was a really kind of brilliant idea. So I wanted to pass that along. But again, thanks to everyone who participated. And just to echo Nancy's sentiments as far as open communication with your roommates, I'm just amazed that you did that so openly. And that's like one of the first things, your presentation was amazing, Sam, by the way. Because um, I think as a non-food allergic person, I'm not someone who's had to deal with food allergies my entire life. I went to college, I went to the dining hall, I was in my dorm room, I never had to consider those things. And just telling the audience out there that feel free to communicate because I hope that people would have felt open with me. I wish I had known more about people's food allergies and what they had to go through and the accommodations that they had when I was back in college. And now I'm learning even more. And so I'm just so excited for you that you felt comfortable doing that and that you knew your rules and what you were comfortable with and felt like you could share that with your roommates. Yeah. yeah a lot of times I'll be like, not this particular case with, with my roommate, but like at camp, um, like, oh, I'm allergic. So maybe you could do that somewhere else, but like, it's fine. You know, it's not like, like they always are like, oh, but it's fine. You know, like, I don't want to impose. And most of the time they go like, no, like I'm not going to eat this because why would I do that for you? And like, you'll be surprised at the people's reactions. Like, like you just said, like people don't want to kill you. So like, just, you know, you can say, but it's fine, but you know, make sure to like be clear about what, what is fine, what's not fine. Um, because they, they will definitely listen to your requests for sure. One of the things I thought was encouraging about the poll was there was pretty high responder rate uh, for the positive on sort of telling other people about your food allergies. And I always feel like that's a, a good sign. I often ask that question actually from actually even, you know, pre-adolescent through adolescence, like do most of your close friends know, you know, kind of getting to Maria's circles of trust. Um, and I, I think that's a healthy sign that you, you know, and Sam, you recognize that, you know, people that care about you, even relatively, you know, casual friends are going you know, to want to do the right thing. They're going to want to respond positively most of the time. Um, uh, so for Krista and Karen, I'm, I'm continuing to scan the um, chat here. If there's something kind of from the live audience, there were a couple of questions submitted in advance that we haven't got to yet that I think are up your alley. Um, things like, you know, what happens with dining services during holiday breaks? And, and a question I alluded to earlier, um, when's the right time for a prospective student or family to engage with dining services or if we're failing to have done that in advance? You know, um, I think, Karen, you touched on this some already, but how to best engage. I encourage students. I know that many students start looking at, I have nieces, niece, twin nieces who are actually juniors in high school and they're looking at colleges. One of them actually has food allergies. So typically when it, I believe it's a break this coming week for Massachusetts. A lot of high school students are going off the college campuses, checking out different college and universities. So it's even as early as junior year. And I've even had a, have a, had a student in a prior school reach out as a sophomore in high school, just kind of get a feel for things to come to campus, go, if you're taking tours, try and come to campus, schedule a tour, see if you can go into the dining hall. See what it what what it what's it like? Experience it for yourself. I always say that um this time of year a lot of schools and colleges are doing their accepted student day. So of course you can see all the landscaping happening on campus. You could see everyone making they're going to present their bats because they want you to come to their school. So some of my advice is when you're checking out the colleges and universities, um, it's never too early. And also plan, plan to take that time and that spend the day there. See if you can get into the dining hall and experience it for yourself. Or even reach out to dining services and let them know that you're coming. And let them know that you have, um, you have accommodations and see how they accommodate you during that visit. And that could be telling. And, and sort of further to that point, right? It, they should be willing to sit down with you and roughly go through you know, this is how we might handle someone with your particular needs, right? Here are the range of options we have. And, and that way you can find out whether you're comfortable with the way that, that you think that they would support you. Um, and then you asked a question about uh, holidays and breaks. Uh, and that's very dependent on the school um, in terms of when they 
when they close, what operations they have open. But again, right, as a student, you have, you have every right to say, I need to know. And, and one example of that might be that if you're accustomed to eating in one dining hall and it's gonna be spring break and you're staying on campus and another dining hall is open, you need to work with that team to say, okay, so I'm gonna eat in another place. Do they know about me? Do they know how to support me? That communication um, it, you know, is, is super important. And in, in every one of our best practices, the answer would be, yeah, no, no sweat, just go right on in, right? But you always wanna double check that, so. And I'd also like to, um, again, um, sort of echo the importance of registering because some of the schools, what they do is similar to what actually Sam has is um, what I, what actually one of my practices is I have to list the students who are registered with um, food allergies. And when they're staying for break, I email all of them. I just kind of do a blast email, blind copy all of them and say, hey, let me know if you're going to be on campus and if you're going to um, need accommodations in the dining hall, we'll take care of you. So it's that, that communication, it goes back to letting me know, not only how you do me in school, but letting, letting me know, hey, I'm Karen, I'm gonna be on, I'm gonna stay on campus for Thanksgiving break, or I'll be here, or I'll be here for a summer session, and I'll be living on campus. Can you ensure that my accommodations are in place? And a lot of times that accommodation, once it's approved, it carries through whenever you're on campus. Great, well, Maria, we're, at the nine o'clock hour and uh, I see some thanks, but no more new questions here. So I think we'll give it over to you for the last word. Well, I, I just want a big thank you um, to our moderators and our panelists and all the MGH um, folks who helped get this off the ground this evening and an even bigger thank you um, to all of you who um, tuned in and participated. And um, one more plug that if you're interested in signing up for our transitions program. I just put the, um, the email address in the chat. Um, and so feel free to send a message there um, and we'd love to have you and continue the conversation. So thanks again, everyone. Um, have a great evening. Congratulations to all of the seniors and we're looking forward to staying in touch. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, guys. This was awesome. Thank you. It's really good. Uh, oh, it's yeah. still recording. So <laughs> yeah, and we still have a few um, participants in the in the um, okay. sign up too. So but thank you for everything, and looking forward to connecting soon. That sounds great. Talk awesome. to you guys later. Thanks, Take everyone. Care.